faith to believe in, it kind of makes you wonder why, why is there suffering in this world? Famine and death, that sort of thing. It was a reason why he took them. Uh, maybe he needed some angels up there to protect them protect to help him in the fight against the devil. A baby is a beautiful, wonderful thing. Why doesn't he want me to have this? I think that bad things are just the way that you see them. I think God's in everything we do. I don't think God does these things to people. I think he has a way of getting us through it. Why would anybody want to create people who do horrible things to each other each and every day? It doesn't make any sense. People suffer because sometimes they put themselves into it and others just, it just happens to them. When my grandma died, she died of cancer like six years ago and I remember like when she was like a few days before she passed away, she was like there couldn't possibly be a God that no one would ever want, no one would ever want to inflict this pain. Some of the best lessons I've learned in life and the best um, feelings in my heart came from very painful times. I don't think God's sitting there and saying these people are hurting and maybe I should help them or we're, I'm going to pray to this you know, being and he's going to save me. I don't think that happens. Um, I think he's just there, I guess. <laughs> I'm constantly struggling, I suppose I'll be brutally honest, with uh, suicidal ideation and I find it very miserable often, despite the beauty of the world, to be made conscious in this form. Why? Why, why does the pain? Why, was, why were the little kids shot the other day? I want to know why this happened, but he's showing me that he's here with me, so I suppose the answers will come. It's just I'm going through a journey right now that's painful. We continue this morning, seven questions non-Christians are asking in our society, and you saw the top response in the Barna surveys. Why is there pain and suffering if there is a loving God? Pat read a while ago from Genesis chapter 3. And Genesis chapter 3 is where it all starts, if you're Job or if you happen to be one of us. In Genesis chapter 3, they have been told... Adam and Eve, don't eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. God said, don't eat of it. You can have anything else, any other tree, any other bush, any other plant, but not that one. That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that tree. And Eve told the serpent, she said, we've been told by God, don't eat it, don't touch it, don't look at it. But the serpent said, oh, he's just trying to keep you from becoming like him. Because after all, isn't that what separates God from the rest of us is knowledge? And so she looked at the fruit and it did look good. So she plucked it off and she ate it. She picked another piece and she gave that to Adam and, and he ate it. And the first thing that came with this knowledge was suddenly that they were, they were naked. They had lost their innocence. And so they hurried off into the bush and they took some fig leaves and they sewed them together and they tried to make clothes out of them. Our homemaking teacher is sitting here. I don't know exactly how hard that is, but I do know this. Fig leaves have the same consistency as okra leaves. So think about that for a little while and let that ponder in your mind. And they sewed those leaves together and they went and hid and it says in the cool of the evening when God came walking through the garden he couldn't find them and he called out Adam where are you no answer Eve where are you no answer and God kept calling and kept calling until it wore on them and they were embarrassed by their hiding and Adam finally stepped out of the woods and said here I am he said, where have you been? He said, I was hiding. Why were you hiding? Because, because I, I knew I was naked. And I didn't want to embarrass myself in front of you. And God said, 
who told you you were naked? And he said one of the classic lines of all time, that woman whom you gave me made me eat the fruit. And Eve said, it wasn't my idea, it was the serpent you made. And God said to the serpent, because of what you have done, you will crawl on your belly and eat the dust of the earth forever and there will be enmity between you and man. And to the woman he said, because you have done this, you'll now have pain in childbirth. And to the man he said, because you have done this, you'll now fight with weeds and thistles and thorns as you try to grow crops in the earth. And that's how it started. It went from the peace and harmony of the Garden of Eden to a fallen world where there's trouble, pain, suffering, disobedience, and sometimes suffering and innocence. And Job, whom the, his introduction to the book says is the wealthiest man of the known world at that time, is one day going about his business when a messenger runs up to him and says, the, Ch the Chaldeans have come and they have taken all of the oxen and the donkeys and they have killed all of the servants and I alone have escaped to tell you about it. And while he's still talking, Another servant runs up and says, Job, fire fell from heaven and consumed all the sheep and the goats and all the servants and I alone have been safe to tell you about it. And as he's still talking, another one runs up and says, the Sabians have come and they've taken all the camels. And while he's still talking, another runs up and says, the worst of all. All 10 of your children were having a dinner in their home and a great wind came down and the walls fell over and everyone is dead except me and I'm alone have come to tell you about it. In one day, in one afternoon from having it all to having nothing. So Job goes, he puts on sackcloth, he put ashes on his head, he goes into mourning and he says naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return to the earth the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away blessed be the name of the Lord and he sat there and then boils became on his skin scripture says from the top of his head to the soles of his feet boils he was in such pain and misery he took a broken piece of pottery and he sat in those ashes and he scraped his sores with that broken piece of pottery and his lovely wife the supportive Mrs. Job came in and she said why don't you just curse God and die and he said oh honey you can't take the good from the Lord and not take the bad from the Lord and he sits there in his misery and his three friends show up and they're good friends because they come in and they see his condition and they don't even recognize him he's in such bad shape and his friends sit with him all week long in this silence and they listen to him moan and groan and suffer and they cry with him and they hold his hand and then after a week Job finally begins to get his bearings a little bit and he says wait a minute this is not fair I am innocent I have done nothing to deserve this he said I have honored God I have offered sacrifices to God as a matter of fact I offered so many sacrifices to God that when I thought my kids might be sinning accidentally I offered sacrifices on their behalf I am innocent why has the Lord brought all this upon me and Job's friend Elphaz is the first to speak up and he says not so fast Job he said I've been around a long time and I know and I know that people harvest what they plant I know something's gone on you're not as innocent as you claim you may think you're innocent he said there's something going on here Job there's something in your past that's done something and Job says oh no I haven't done anything to deserve this 
And for 42 chapters, that argument rolls. Same thing over and over and over again examining all the philosophical reasons why this has come upon Job innocence justified you see I'm kind of like Elphaz a little bit I kind of like to think that we kind of get what we deserve and a matter of fact I think you do too because I've talked to some of you I've been around you when someone's got a diagnosis that their arteries are clogged and somebody will say well you know I've, I've seen him eat chicken fried steak every day smoked for 30 years didn't take care of himself got overweight now he's got heart trouble that shouldn't be any surprise to anybody you flip that coin around You'll find people from time to time who have eaten well, exercised, watched their weight, didn't smoke, and they go to the doctor and the doctor says, uh, your arteries are clogged. You've got bad DNA. Now wait a minute. I can understand, we sold this over here, but you mean to tell me I've been, my, my mom and daddy gave me this? That's not fair. And we roll those arguments time after time after time. I, I think about Maddie Higgins. Maddie Higgins was nine years old and lived in Arlington, Texas. And last June, the emergency ice company of Dallas came and put six inches of snow in her front yard. It's 20,000 pounds of ice to make six inches of snow in her front yard. And they kept her in the back of the house till it was all ready. And her mother told her, you need to put on your snow boots and your mittens. And she said, why? And they went to the front door and there it was. And little Maddie with her friends made little snowmen and threw snowballs in June. Because she has a cancer called geoblastoma. It's a brain cancer. She'd had nine surgeries and countless chemotherapy treatments. Normally, it's an, it comes only to adults, and they can kind of treat it in adults, but in a nine-year-old, it was ineffective. So in June, they gave up, and they made snow in her yard, and she played in the snow, and she passed away in August. Now, I, I don't understand that nine-year-old baby what does she do she hasn't sown anything she hasn't cultivated any problems why is she harvesting what she hasn't sown that's the story that rolls throughout Job last week I got a call one of our trustees at Wayland's grandson was in the hospital so on Thursday afternoon, I stopped by the hospital and saw his grandparents. Sterling's seven. Lives over at Tatum, New Mexico. They only go to school in Tatum Monday through Thursday. And last Friday, they were working cattle, he and his dad, and they were out rounding up some cattle in the pasture. And his horse wasn't going as fast as he wanted it to. And he kind of spurred it a little bit and made that horse angry. And the horse took off out from under Sterling. And he held on to the saddle horn, hollering, Daddy, what I do? And Daddy said, you know what to do. Just slide off. And he slid off, but he slid off into a patch of cleachy rocks and he hit his head. And he's been asleep for 10 days now. Now in that waiting room, they're passing around pictures of what an ornery little kid this is on their phone. They showed him at the last time they were cutting cattle, running around with a pair of calf fries, chasing these little girls. That's the kind of kid he is. They weren't asking those kinds of easy questions. There in that ICU waiting room, they're asking the questions of why has this happened? 
It's the question of Job. And it's all around us in this world. I was at a Texas World Hunger meeting in Plainview a couple of weeks ago. It was put on, the meeting was hosted by the Baylor School of Social Work and talking about hunger in Texas and ways to feed people and programs that are available. And we got to working through it and the question and answer time and I made the mistake of asking some questions about how to do benevolence work and man, the stories just started coming. And the stories were those questions about our church used to do this and then we'd find out that the parents would take the money they did get and spend it on things they shouldn't be spending it on and we were feeding the kids and our church members just threw up their hands and said, we're not gonna do that anymore. And they told story after story after story and then this pastor sitting next to me from Health Center leaned over and he said, how do you keep from being jaded in this business? How do you keep from getting skeptical? And I said, well, I don't know the answer for everybody, but I know what works for me. I said, on those days when you offer food and you find out the money that was available got spent on a big screen TV, I have to remind myself that four-year-old kid didn't ask for any of that. That innocent little child who's been born into those circumstances didn't ask for any of those bad decisions it's the innocent that we gravitate toward and in these discussions of suffering it is the innocent that pulls us in but here's what's wrong and if you don't hear anything else this morning you hear this here's what's wrong with the video is that every description they gave of God is a philosophical description. It is not a description of the Christian God. The discussion they had is God is love, God is all powerful, evil exists. And if God is all loving and God is all powerful, then he ought to keep evil from hurting us. That's the struggle behind every question in the video. But what they're missing is that the God that we worship, the God of the Father of Jesus Christ knows exactly what this world is like. He sent his only son into this fallen world where he was beaten, spit upon, nailed to a cross, suffered and died. God knows all about the suffering of this world. And he knows all about what happens to innocent people. And God would say to Elphaz, Elphaz, your logic may seem right, but it doesn't work in this world of sin. Because sometimes bad things happen in a sinful and fallen world. Just because this is where we are. And God knows all about that in Jesus Christ. Peter DeVries has a novel called The Blood of the Lamb. In it, the narrator, Don, introduces their family. They are a Dutch family. His father was from the Netherlands and he came to America to visit family in New York. And it was such a miserable six week boat ride in the bottom of that steamer with wave upon wave and six weeks of seasickness that when he crawled out onto the dock in New York Harbor, he kissed the dock and he said, I am never doing that again. And he sold his return passage ticket and he stayed in America and he moved to Chicago where they joined the second group that gave them prominence. They were now part of the Dutch Reform Presbyterian Church. And the novel opens with everybody in one house, extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody talking about faith. And one of the young boys has taken up a medical degree at the University of Chicago and he has decided there is no such thing as God and there is no such thing as faith. It doesn't make any sense. And they do all the arguments. Can you believe the scripture? Evil and suffering. Every argument about evolution. And then Don begins to grow up and begins to make his way in the world. And he meets a young woman and they fall in love and they're about 
to marry and settle down in Chicago when Don gets kind of tired. And he goes to the doctor and the doctor runs a few x-rays and the doctor says to him, you've got tuberculosis. He said, I can't have tuberculosis. I'm just 22. I'm fixing to get married. He said, no, you've got tuberculosis. He said, if you're lucky, maybe in a year, two years, you'll be well. The doctor wrote down the name of a place and he said, this sanitarium is outside of Denver, Colorado and it's run by the Presbyterian Church and they'll let you come there and heal up in that dry climate for $3 a day. So his family put him on a train and sent him to Denver and he left his girlfriend at home. While he's in the sanitarium, he meets another young girl who talks to him because the girl at home has quit writing letters. And they strike up a friendship and before long he thinks she's the most beautiful thing he's ever seen in his life. And one day he goes by her room and she is not in her room and the nurse says she's not back from surgery yet. He said, she didn't tell me she was having surgery. Yeah, she's having surgery right now. What are they doing? He said, well, they're taking out some of her ribs so that her lungs can expand a little bit. Don goes outside and he stomps around in the snow and in the cold endangering his old health threatening about what's going on and while he's out there he's arguing with God about why in the world can you let this happen to this sweet girl and as he is arguing with God he sees headlights coming through the gate of the sanitarium and there comes the hearse and she has not made it and Don's life becomes kind of the story of Job while he's there he gets a message from home that says your dad has lost his mind he needs to be put in an institution. And when Don is released, he takes the train back to Chicago and he finds his father in an institution and he is, he is not the man he left. And on one of his visits of the institution, he's walking past a park bench and he sees the girl he was going to marry. They begin to visit and he sits down beside her and she tells him why she's there, that she's lost her mind because after he left, she was raped at work. Her parents sent her away when she was discovered she was pregnant. They left that baby in that home and she came back to Chicago and she could not find her way. They meet, they talk, she gets better, they marry. Her life falls apart. Too much depression, too much alcohol, too many bad choices. But out of that is born a little girl. Carol, the light of his life, who does great until she's about 11. And one day, she just has this fever and no energy and she's hurting in her back. And they go to the doctor and it's not clear right away what it is, but they think it's strep. So they give her a penicillin shot and it seems to help for about a week. And then after tests, it's leukemia. And the story just spins from there. Treatments, hospital, treatments, hospital, try this, try that. Treatments, hospital, in all the midst of this, he sits in a hospital waiting room talking to other parents and it is the conversation of Job. Why are we here? Why our babies? What has happened? Why are this taking place? Ultimately, Carol dies, the young girl, as does his wife. And in the end of the book, he's alone. And nothing in his life has worked out the way he planned. And he says, out of his atheism, this is what I've learned. I have learned that there is a God who comes along beside us in compassion when we need him most. He calls it in the last paragraph, the throb of compassion coming from the heartbeat of God. We worship a God who knows all about suffering, 
who sent his only son into this world to be a sacrifice for our sins, to make things right for us. He's not an abstract God who just wound the universe and lets it go. He's a God who's involved in our lives. And there is that throb of compassion coming from the heartbeat of God. When we're innocent or when we're harvesting what we've sown, God doesn't care. He is there. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we hope the stories from your word have spoken to our hearts this morning. Whether we suffer in innocence or whether we suffer from choices, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you are a God who knows what pain is like and what hurt is. And you are a God who understands everything we face. Lord, thank you for knowing us, for being involved with us, and for carrying us along. Lord, I ask this morning that your Holy Spirit speak into the hearts of every person here with the questions they face in the circumstances that are theirs. May they know. May we know. You are the God who's involved with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn this morning is, I am stand amazed in the presence. We invite any to come who need to make a decision for Christ, calling him Lord and Savior. You come this morning. Those of you looking for a church home, you come and join with us. If you've been facing the questions and you want to have a word of prayer, you come this morning and we'll pray together. Let's stand and sing together.